Welcome back to another episode of the Nonprofit Show, everyone. I'm Julia Patrick with the American Nonprofit Academy. Hey, welcome, Dylan Bassett. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm happy to be with you. Oh, my gosh. I'm really excited to talk with you. Dylan Bassett, CEO and founder of Department One Solutions. You know, we're going to be talking about change, and this is such a hard topic for so many of us. And so this is going to be a really good conversation because we're right at that nexus point of where we're moving into a really hard season for most nonprofits, moving towards the fourth quarter year end, all the things that that entails. And then we're talking about operational transformation, which probably scares a lot of folks. And so I know, Dylan, you're going to help us to understand what we need to be doing and how we need to be rethinking about this. But before we rethink anything, we need to thank our sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraising Friday, our new episode on Fridays, um, dedicated expressly to fundraising. It's super fun and really interesting. And then 180 Management Group. Okay, we have, as you know, a fabulous group of co-hosts. I'm flying solo today, as I like to say with Dylan, but I hope you've been able to get to meet and know them because they're just amazing. They come from all over the country. They do different things and they really are rock stars. Okay, Dylan Bassett, you're a rock star, I can tell. CEO and founder of Department One Solutions. Talk to us about what Department One does. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so Department One is an affordable management consultancy for small community-based nonprofits. And we tend to work with clients that are in annual budgets of like one to $3 million. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the work that we do uh, kind of revolves around this core tenets of people, process, and technology. So we help people with their systems. We help the people work better together. Um, and we implement standard processes that help people do work more efficiently. Wow, that's intense because <laughs> we know that the nonprofit sector a lot of times messes up when it becomes evident that there are efficiencies that are lacking. And so to get somebody from the outside that can come in and point some of those things out is super powerful. Um, you know, today we're going to be talking about something that's a really tough call. And, and I'm, I, I'm really interested about this because transformation is such a frightening word for so many folks. And if you look at the screen, if you're watching us live or our archive um, or one of our many platforms, you'll see this really interesting graphic that we found. I have no idea how we found this. But it looks like it's the word change, but there's also a C in there and it, and it means something different, chance. So talk about operational transformation. Let's start, our, start off, Dylan, with what that even means. Yeah, so I mean, the main aim for any project that I work on with a client is just better efficiency on the same or a lower budget. And you know, we kind of think of these in terms of like an investment. So if you invest your time or your budget today to do something better for the future, you end up saving that over the course of a year or two years, and it repays itself in having more time to work on mission delivery um, or having a more efficient use of your budget. And that's really kind of the crux of everything that we do, but it takes shape in you know a lot of different ways. When you have somebody that comes to you or is even willing to have this conversation are they like at a point where they're on their knees and they're struggling or are they at the, you know, I always think of, are you at the peak or are you at the valley? Are you at the top or the bottom? Like, because it seems to me in the nonprofit sector, and we spoke about this briefly in the green room, uh, the nonprofit sector is not known for taking risks and embracing change. I'd say I've encountered both. Um, I've worked with nonprofits that are growing and they are at a peak and they need operational efficiency and transformation in order to make that work, um, in order so that they, you know, don't basically fall back to where they were. Um, right. I, I wouldn't say I've necessarily encountered a ton of organizations that are on their knees, as you say. 
Um, I think nonprofits tend to have a pretty high tolerance for this type of thing, this kind of inefficiency, because it sort of gets baked into the way that people work over a period of time. Um, and I mean, a lot of them know kind of the problems that they want to solve. It's just finding someone that can spend the time to do it when typically, especially with the nonprofits that I work with that are more community based and tend to be a little bit lower revenue, uh, they just don't have the people that can go and do it while also delivering on the mission. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting that you said that the, the one comment is that it seems like they have a, a greater tolerance for suffering through something. That's fascinating to me because that speaks across a lot of issues on how we manage, how we craft strategy. Um, if we're just willing to take the brunt of something that's not working, uh, I, I see that as a real hallmark um, and a difference between the for-profit and the nonprofit sector. There are a lot of areas where the nonprofit sector is like, we're not going to deal with that, you know, past five minutes, move it along or the right. nonprofit sector will suffer through. What do you see along those lines? I think, um, you know, it's maybe uh, not the best wording, but I think nonprofits sort of forget that they're businesses as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you look at, when you look at, you know, the most efficient corporations, like the biggest businesses that do the best, they're hyper-focused on the way that they work most mm -hmm. often. Uh, and nonprofits, rightly so, are hyper focused on kind of what their the outcomes mm -hmm. of their work, and they sort of forget the stuff that makes it happen, and don't realize that there's an opportunity in thinking of yourself more along the lines of we are still a business, we still need to do things efficiently, um, mm -hmm. and I think something that gets missed a lot too is that when nonprofits have strong operations, they have a higher capacity for work and thus mission delivery, um, which naturally is going to result in more reach, uh, more impact, and that makes them more attractive to donors. Um, donors don't want to give to an organization that money is just going to circle around and they're going to spin their wheels trying to get something done. They want to give to an organization that they know runs a strong operation and can go and get stuff done out in the real world in terms of mission delivery. And so I think people think about it like, oh, you know, we have some IT guy or we have some process guy and he's <laughs> going to make us do something new. But, you know, it ends up being that we can do this better and faster and more efficiently and we can get more work done and we can now have more stories to tell that make us more attractive to donors as well and other supporters for that matter. Yeah, I, I love that through line because I think you're absolutely right. I think it's a, a you know, it, it's almost the way you need to be able to articulate this, to sell this to your board, to your C-suite, to people who are frankly are afraid of change, right? I mean, because, you know, a lot of, I can see a lot of organizations that are like, well, we don't need to embark upon this because we're doing great. We just need a few tweaks because it almost seems like a point of failure, right? Like you have to um, own up maybe. It, I mean, does that sound right? Yeah, I, I think it's that. And I mean, um, you know, it, it's like you, you have someone that helps you with your taxes, right? <laughs> because taxes are complicated. Uh, yeah. Like technology and process and, you know, good project management and kind of piecing all these things together, especially across you know, your marketing and your development folks and, you know, your service delivery folks, bring that all together. It's can be simple, but it's not easy necessarily. And you hire a professional to help you with complicated things. And it's really no different in this space. And like you said, like, we're doing great, but we just need a few tweaks. That's right. oftentimes the difference between something feeling like it's really kind of a piece of junk and mm -hmm something feeling like wow you know it's right. completely new it, it works the way that we mm -hmm. want it to i a lot of you know i just finished up a project with a client actually um and they were just you know having some issues bringing data in from web forms that they use as um, like requests for service and bringing that into their crm 
uh, and they'd been dealing with this for months and months and they had another consulting agency come in and build it for them and they kind of described it as unfinished business and it was a really easy step to take together to just say like okay where are we at today what do we want this to look like and you know we wrapped up a problem that they were dealing with for six months in a matter of i think it was like five or six weeks uh mm -hmm. and you know i went in and visited the office they're like are you the one that like helped us with this data stuff and i was like yeah they're like oh my gosh it's so nice like it's so much easier and that helps them do you know the, some of that was like demographic reporting and so they can now report more clearly on the different demographics that they're serving which helps them become eligible for different types of grants and might be more appealing to different types of donors. So it's a very small thing. And, you know, like I mentioned at the top as well, my whole thing is affordable consulting services um, because I worked at a large national consultancy and um, I really liked the work, but I wanted to, one, I wanted more autonomy. I've always considered myself an entrepreneur, um, mm. but there wasn't really a marketplace for accessible and affordable consulting mm -hmm. projects in the nonprofit space. They can't go spend $50,000 on some mm -hmm. project, right? Um, right? So it's all about being affordable so that they can see like, okay, if we do this, you know, we could reasonably be able to report better and capture a grant or secure a donor by being able to tell this story because of the data that we're getting that pays this project back with, in, with interest this year. And then from there on, then, you know, then it's all great. You know, Dylan, it, it moves me to my next question. And that is, you know, the benefits of operational improvement. Do you find that um, nonprofits or clients understand what the benefits are going to be? I mean, you, you used an example of finishing up a project and having feedback that was super positive. Do you think people can understand how much better their work environment, their productivity, their impact is going to even be? Um, or is there just a, you know, a, trying to solve a problem in essence, as opposed I to get gaining advantage? I think the, the, as you put it, sort of the through line to how this makes us more attractive as a nonprofit for donors is potentially less clear in most cases. But in terms of, um, you know, what they want it to look like and how much they think it will improve their work, that is very obvious to them. Because a lot of the things that they want to change are things that they're dealing with every single day. Hmm. And to this point, too, I, you know, there's some stats that 38% of nonprofits report challenges in managing their workload. And so they know that if they could just do something quicker, or didn't have to spend as much time on a certain task, yeah. that things could be better and they could get more done and maybe they'd be less stressed or, you know, have less burnout. And that contributes to staff retention as well. Um, but I mean, in terms of benefits, yeah, I, I, I think it's less obvious at the outset, like they just want to solve a problem. And then as we go and we say like, oh, now we can do this. And what's like the <laughs> follow on two, three steps of that. And it kind of like opens their eyes, you know, like halfway through the project or so. You know, Dylan, it's so interesting because I was just thinking about how, um, you know, you'll limp your technology along and then all of a sudden you get a new phone or, you know, the latest and greatest computer or laptop. And then all of a sudden you're like, holy moly, look at how much more efficient I am. Look how much faster I get these things done. Look at the quality, all of these me measurements that you can, you just kind of, became immune to because you had to use what you had. And then you think back, I mean, I know I, I've done this over the trajectory of my career. And then I'd be like, why didn't I make that investment sooner? Why didn't I get that, you know, newer version of the software or that laptop or technology across the board? Right. Um, and so you said something so interesting in the very beginning in that we, we kind of become immune to what's going on. We just kind of stumble through and, and dare I say, suffer through, right? Which is not a healthy way at all to be thinking about any of this, um, especially when we're trying to, you know, craft better uh, impact and really build our nonprofits. Um, so let's ask the big question, which is like the big elephant in the room. 
why do we do this? Why do we ignore <laughs> that we need to make these changes or that we need to stop? Stop. And, and, yeah, and, and, and I think, I don't think most nonprofits really ignore it, right? I Because I think, like I mentioned, I think most of the time, the problems that they want to solve are staring them right in the face every single day that they go to work. It really just comes down to resource constraints. Um, mm -hmm. And just this is the way that it is. Um, and part of it, it, like this is really why I started my practice is because um, I don't think there's really been a lot of providers in this space kind of doing this nitty gritty kind of granular work, data mapping, you know, systems integrations, that sort of thing on an affordable basis. Um, so they just thought they were kind of stuck or had to shell out a lot of money. And if you don't have a lot of money, which a lot of nonprofits don't to go spend, you know, thousands of dollars on a consulting project, uh, tens of thousands of dollars, um, then they're just kind of stuck. There's no option for them. Um, and so I think it's, I mean, then they'll just end up building workarounds for these operational yeah. deficiencies, which they say, this doesn't work the way that we want it to. So we're going to kind of do this downstream to remedy for it. Mm -hmm. And then that's really not the best way that you want to be going about it. And so they kind of just do these things more out of necessity. And mm -hmm. it sort of creates, you know, a stream of things that are, you know, less than best practice processes mm -hmm. and ways of working that are, you know, kind of offspring of one original problem. And yeah. it just like entrenches it further. And that's what I was saying. It kind of gets baked in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what you just said is magical. I mean, it's 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 awful to hear that articulated, but we've all been there, right? Where you do one thing that is kind of minor because something wasn't working, you create that workaround. And then before you know it, you're building on that work workaround as right. opposed to actually going back and navigating the original problem. You're kind of just, you know, taping and paper clipping and stapling things together. Um, we call I it, uh, we ahead. call it tech debt. So if, if you ever want to use that, it's called tech debt. And it's, it's just that it's where you kind of build something that's not great. And then you build on top of it and really all of that, all that whole thing is just debt that's going to need to be repaid at some point because it just can't last. You know, that is fascinating. I'm going to totally, <laughs> totally use that because I, I don't think there's anyone. I didn't come there. up with that for the record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you shared it. So, you know, but sure. honest to goodness, we all see this, right? And we may not, we may not be able to articulate it, um, but we see this and it seems to me, Dylan, that this becomes even more of an issue when we face growth, because we might have something that's going on, let's say, in the development team and fundraising, and then we need to get into, you know, um, volunteer management. And then we got to try and link the, those, you know, groups together. And then the marketing folks want to link in. And it, it just seems like it's such a man, it's such a moving target, right? I guess the frustration to me is that it's not a one and done, right? It's a, it's very much a living, breathing right. thing. And if you want to, you know, if you want to grow your nonprofit, uh, you know, you might need to enhance a process or get a new system or figure out a new way to do things. And then if you grow further or add teams or, you know, kind of break off responsibilities, um, you know, it just sort of continues to add complexity. But mm -hmm. the important piece is, is having a solid foundation mm -hmm. of, you know, we know the system that we want to work on. We know the way that we want to work, the structure of our organization. Um, and that's really what we try and kind of turn the clock back on a lot of these projects is, let's kind of get you back to a point where we understand everything and then we can go from there and start to add complexity as the organization grows and as needs change. Yeah. I, I really, I like what you're saying because it also makes it less fearful, right? Definitely. Versus like people are like, Oh no, another change. I right. have to, like, I have to learn something new or I have to redo right. or whatever. And that can be such a, um, that, that's just a mindset that's so negative too, right? 
I mean, well, and if I can, I mean, just on the point of like learning something new, you know, learning something new is a lot harder when you don't have a great teacher and not to call myself a great teacher by, you know, kind of outright, but, uh, a lot of what I do for clients as well is just documentation. You know, this idea of change management um, and best practices for how we communicate changes and documenting what are the new things that we're going to work by, how do these systems work, what data is coming out of them, just simple stuff like how-to guides to use these new things. Um, and doing that, having that in mind from the start and making sure that that all of that information makes its way across anyone in the organization that needs to know it um, tends to make it a lot easier. Uh, surprisingly so, like I'll finish up a project, we send them the documentation package, uh, and then, you know, I'll follow up and it's like, hey, you know, any questions, any problems? And they're like, no, you know, things are working good. Like, I understand it. I use the docs. It was helpful. Uh, like, we'll let you know if anything else comes up. And it's like, awesome. Like that's yeah. the goal so that they can begin to stand on their own two feet and not have to call someone back anytime there's a problem um, and really start to build more of an understanding of, you know, the systems and the processes that they work. Right. In. Right. And reframe process in success. I think that's the other thing, you know, when you're, when you're not having success and you're, you're just having frustration, then that, that to me builds disengagement. Right. Um, right. And so, well, we don't have a lot of time left, but I think you've sold us on this concept that we've got to be thinking in a transformational way. We've got to be looking at um, ending our tech debt. Oh my God, I love this so much. Perfect, yeah. It's just wonderful. So how do we go about it? Like how? what are the first steps that we need to take towards operational improvement? Because I'm wondering if we even really know what our pain points or our problems are. Yeah. So, I mean, the when you look at some of the research around this idea, the word that comes up is digital maturity. Uh -huh. um, getting away from paper processes, getting away from manual workflows, seeing where we can implement um, not even AI in its fullest extent, but just simple kind of rules-based automation, um, defining communication channels, simple things like this of it's less so about like what do we need to change and it's more like the place to start is really just defining what we want to get done um yeah. and you know that kind of starts with our strategy um mm -hmm. and feeds into all right if these are kind of the big bold ideas that we want to go and pursue um you know what are kind of the tactical boots on the ground type of things that we need to do in order to achieve it. And then as we go and do those things, defining how we're doing them. So we're gonna set this up, um, we're gonna work in a certain thing, this type of way, and just really getting a sense of where are we sitting today um, is really the best play to, place to start. Um, and then, you know, like I mentioned with digital maturity, 41% um, of nonprofits have increased their use of digital communication and over 50% of nonprofits have increased investment in tools that can help them drive innovation. So these are things, um, tech for streamlining operations, kind of breaking down silos and like that cross-functional collaboration, um, getting rid of inefficient working habits. So these are, you know, things moving between people back and forth, manual data entry, um, and then workload difficulties. So doing things more efficiently so that people have more time to spend on more different things or so that you can save budget to maybe grow your team um, or like we mentioned, deliver more impact and you know get more donors. It almost seems to me, Dylan, like you're talking about an audit, you know, coming yeah, in. That's a good saying, way to put it. Yeah, like where where is everybody? Because it, it seems to me, Dylan, that um, you don't know what you don't know, right? And because, and you mentioned this, I mean, the, the explosion and the forced change due to COVID of, of the digital nature in the nonprofit sector has really changed how we're behaving and how we're doing so many things. And yet um, it has really come about quickly, right? Not having embraced any of this technology 
And then all of a sudden you're in it and you haven't even taken a deep breath to figure out what's working and what's not. Yeah. And I, to that point, a lot of organizations are still struggling with work from home uh, and yeah. being able to manage that not even just from simply, you know, worker productivity, uh, but even just from the basic, you know, technology needs of working from home. Um, and I mean, certainly that's a place to start, uh, but it, it really just does kind of come back to that digital maturity and getting everyone on the same page in terms of what tools we're going to use, um, you know, how we're going to leverage technology, who's responsible for what, what are the steps involved in each of these different processes? Because a lot of things are a little tribal in nonprofits, especially smaller nonprofits, where you have these ways of working that are passed down through, you know, people just telling you verbally or sending it in an email and it's never archived and documented and kept in one place where someone could go and look at it later. And so that's really, that's really the place to start is just, adding definition to those things and getting them in one place of this is how we operate. Mm -hmm. Wow. I love that you use that word tribal because that is the perfect, it's the quintessential word actually for what goes on because our egos get in the way. We think we know what we can do best and then we can't open up to new ideas, new people and new structures. And then hence, we just keep doing the same thing and expecting exactly. something different. So very, very interesting. Well, I've really enjoyed this conversation today. I feel like it's the perfect um, kind of, it's first of all, depending on where, when you're watching this, I mean, we're, go, we're live on a Monday. This is a good conversation for a Monday um, as we lead into, you know, um, a new season and a change of the, the marketplace as we go into that fourth quarter push, so many nonprofits have so much writing on this last quarter. And, uh, and it's frightening. It's frightening for a lot of folks. I mean, we see the, the um, escalation of concern and stress in our sector, really pushing to get all these things done um, and having them work efficiently. And so, um, you, my friend, have taught me a lot of new things today and, and helped kind of tie some of these these pieces together. So thank you. Of course. It's been great to be here. I appreciate it as well. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. You know, I think that um, Dylan brought up so many great things. And, and if you want to get in touch with him or chat with him more, Dylan Bassett, CEO and founder of Department One Solutions. Dylan, what's your uh, URL? Uh, so you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I think the end of that is just Dylan dash B. Uh, otherwise you can search for my search for me by name, uh, Dylan Bassett. Uh, okay. it is Dylan dash B otherwise department one solutions.com. It's just like you see it on the screen. D E P T one solutions.com. And you'll be able to find me there, uh, read some of my testimonials as well as kind of some of the out of the box projects that I offer to the market. Awesome. Well, it's been really interesting. And I think that um, you've, you've kind of given us some ideas on where we can be before we are in a crisis position and how we can be forward thinking and looking at this more strategically. Um, and then understanding, I think my other big lesson was that this is a living, breathing thing. It's not a one and done that um, we're going to have to be flexible in our approaches and our understanding that we always have to make these investments and, and bring ourselves and our teams along and our boards along because this isn't just um you know we we fix this once and we never have to come back because the ecosystem sure. of how we work is diff is changing i mean every minute of the day um absolutely so, yeah this has been really really interesting Dylan, thank you so much. It's been a joy to have you on today for another episode of The Nonprofit Show. You know, we have amazing sponsors and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, our new episode on Fridays just dedicated to fundraising, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that are with us day in and day out so we can help you achieve your impact. Hey, Dylan, we end every episode of The Nonprofit Show with this mantra, and it goes like this. 
to stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everyone.